Grow CFO is where finance leaders grow together. Join thousands of like-minded professionals using Grow CFO to access the combined knowledge and experience of the finance leader community. You can join us today at growcfo.net. Hello and welcome to the Grow CFO show. I'm your host, Kevin Appleby, and today I've got with me Walter Raybergen, who is from Unium, and we're going to talk about the subject of a subscription pricing, something that's very close to the heart of SaaS companies and edtech companies, but we're going to find the ins and outs about it today and some of the trends of things that are happening now that change the model yet again. So, Walter, welcome to the Grow CFO Show. Thank you so much, Kevin. Nice to be here. Before we start, tell me a little bit about your role in Unium and what makes you an authority in this area. So I think my role in Unium is is very much helping the company grow. So business development strategy mainly. So really working on the long-term goals, not so much direct sales, but really like, okay, where should we be? Where are trends going? How should we act on those trends in the coming years to come? That's what I'm doing. That's because of a background in working for finance companies and working with finance departments, especially focused in M&A, so a merger and acquisition, so acquiring companies and dealing with venture capitals, private equity. So uh, always had a big passion for finance and being able to work with finance people on a daily basis is a fantastic thing. So you get a lot of energy out of it. So the idea of subscription pricing, yeah, that, that originally came from the idea that rather than a one-off payment for software and then maybe some ongoing maintenance fees, turned it into an annual payment where you were paying for a license each year and you got recurring revenue. That's probably the thrust of why Unium exists, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I think in general, there was this big trend indeed, like you said, the softwares used to be sold on maybe a disk drive or like a CD disk or a floppy even if you're dead from that generation. But they usually had a fixed price tag and that was it. And then we slowly saw a transition like, okay, we need predictable revenue. We need something that tells our customers and attaches them to us. So they also don't leave our product. They just stick with us and need repeatability and turn that into a subscription business. And that's where Union came in. And even more specifically on the complex versions of that, right? Because you have different types of subscriptions everywhere you have. The Netflix types where you have three flavors, you pick one and then that's going to be it for your lifetime. But what you see in a lot of enterprise deals where you have negotiations and, you know, different tiers are agreed, different structures, different billing rules, different terms and conditions, different, many different things. As soon as sales is involved, they're creative people, right? They're going to make something up. And that also needs to be automated in addition to that Netflix thing. So we do the more advanced ones. That's the specific need we focus on. Yeah. And subscription models do start getting complicated fairly easily i'm thinking of our own journey in grow cfo as a membership business we thought well right at the beginning let's keep this nice and simple everything that we do let's just bundle it up into a membership but then we thought well hang on people will want to pay either monthly or annually well that's easy so we've got two different types of members monthly members annual members of course we started in the uk so we'll have to make sure that people pay in pounds Then it got a bit more complicated when we realized that, well, hang on a minute, Americans don't buy in pounds. Americans only like buying in dollars. Okay, so we'll have to have a dollar membership as well as a pound membership. Oh, we have a euro membership as well. And then we ended up with a second type of membership that gave, oh, that's an individual membership. Now let's have a team membership. So you can come along as the CFO plus bring your finance team with you. So, well, we want to wrap that all together in a package, wouldn't we? And so it grew and so it grew. And I think now with various things, we've got about 10 different types of membership, which all together gets quite complicated. So you can understand the reason for having a tool like Unium. Uh, We we use something different called Thrivecart, but they do the same sorts of things. But it gives you, at least it gives you some regular recurring income. But the model's changing. It is. So, yes, we finally nailed down on that subscription. We finally managed to transition away from that, you know, one-off purchase. And we moved to a stable, stable, predictable revenue model. And now, hey, let's change it up again. We also entered a a bit of an economic downturn there, I think, on on a more of a global scale. And then people tend to look at 
what am I paying for certain things? And then become more critical on that as well. Like, you know, I have your solution. I like your solution, but I only use 50% of that. So I don't want to pay 100% of that. And it's always the case, right? When you have lots of money, you care a bit less on how you spend it. If you're happy, then it's good. But when money is tight, things are changing. So there was already a bit of a transition away or away, like an expansion to the recurring revenue model, moving more to a usage-based model. So kind of a pay-as-you-go, if you can call it that, uh, model. And I think economic decline is greatly impacting that transition because I think everyone expected that to be more popular by the end of 2030. But now you see, I think most researchers say by the end of 24, already 50% of the people will have something like this. So quite a drastic change. Pay as you go rather yeah. than a fixed membership. So yeah. you're still not paying for it up front and then having it for life. You're still paying at regular intervals. Yeah. Pay as you go, that suggests that the payment that you make either month to month or year to year can be variable. Yeah, exactly. And I think what you see is typically two different models. You really see like, uh, you know, well, let, let's give a warehouse as an example. You own a warehouse, you give me the keys to your warehouse, it's full of bananas, and you give me the keys and say, this is my warehouse, you enter, it's free of charge, but I'm going to come back in one month and see how many bananas you ate, and then I'm going to charge you for those bananas. That's really pay as you go. Like, this yeah. is the key to the house. You eat, we'll come charging you afterwards. But you also have sort of, I don't know what the actual term is for this, but I call it correct as agreed. So like, you know, you say to a customer, here's the key to my warehouse, I'm going to charge you five pounds per day for just access to that, but I'm also, and in that access, you have access to eat three bananas on a daily basis. But at the end of the month, I'm gonna go check if you didn't eat more than those three bananas, because I'm gonna charge you if you eat more than those three. In union terms, we call that measured product. So we agree something, we're gonna measure if you're gonna to stick to that, or if there should be an overage or maybe even a credit if you do that as well. Like if you eat less bananas. Yeah, so that's taking a step on then. I'm thinking yeah. about our own website hosting model. We're paying for a level of service and we can upgrade and we can downgrade at any time we want. But this is suggesting that upgrade or downgrade almost happens seamlessly. It's just part of the contract and what you pay yeah. is what you use. Yeah, exactly. And that's the benefit and predictability as well, because there's lots of products out there as well where you don't use the product for the full year as intensively. Like if you would have an indexation module in a finance tool, for instance, or in a subscription management tool for that matter. I mean, many companies do indexation once, maybe twice a year. If you would charge, if that would be a separate module you could acquire, you would pay that on a monthly basis. You would be probably unhappy with that module for 11 months of the year and would be super happy with that module once a year. So a pay as you go would be a super nice model to support an indexation like you know we're only we're charging you something extra if you run an indexation on our platform people would get the benefit out of that because they also value-based pricing if you look at an indexation and you see you press a button on i'm going to increase now my existing customer base with five percent indexation just naming an example there's this big money amount there which says okay then you're going to get x on revenue then that suddenly to pay that for that indexation module is doesn't hurt you so bad because you see like, okay, but it's going to give me this, right? It's right there in your face. So that's a super cool example of something you don't need every day, but it's super relevant. So I suppose putting a CFO hat onto this, if I'm the CFO buying the service, kind of like this, because this means that I can control my costs to only pay for what I use. Yeah. I suppose if I was doing a cost reduction, or advising somebody on how to do a cost reduction, one of the first things I'd say to them is, hey, go and have a look at all of your subscriptions, all of the things you're paying out for regularly. You probably put a very good business case together when you first decided to take that service. You justified yeah. it. But three years on, you're still paying this subscription. Is the justification still there? Or is this just something that disappears out of the bank account every month or every year? Yeah. And there's a lot of things that that happens. Definitely. I put, the, put a hat on of the CFO of the selling company. Well, why did I like this model in the first place? It gave me a recurring revenue. It meant that I could predict very accurately what I was going to get 
Okay, folk would cancel from time to time, but the churn rate's likely to be very low. And I really like this because actually one of the pluses here is this because the churn rate is low, I'm probably selling to a lot of people who having this as a bit of an insurance policy, they're still paying for my service, even though they don't really use it. Yeah. And in terms of the valuation of my own company, all this recurring revenue, that's very nice. That actually puts my multiplier up if I'm selling the business. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So there is the question over variable usage. How do we square the circle, as it were, on that recurring revenue going missing? How do we start forecasting our revenue streams going forward if it's going to depend on people's usage? Yeah, that's a super relevant question. And I think one of the biggest uh, head scratchers at the moment for many CFOs. And I think there's a few things typically advised. I mean, I'm assuming your audience is very familiar with many of the SaaS metrics like MR, monthly recurring revenue, AR, annual equivalent of that. But you also have something called EMR, estimated monthly recurring revenue. And that is a real booking based financial metric. So it's triggered based on either on a contractual event, like a new deal or an upsell or something like that. And the EMR is really a customer guess. So how good it is, you're going to find out later, right? So when you're speaking to a customer and you give them the access to your warehouse of bananas, let's keep on using this example. You ask them or sales ask them typically, what do you think? How many bananas will you eat? That is not a contractual commitment. That is just a question. And they will give you an answer and they say uh, 50. Kevin, I will, give you, I will eat 50 bananas. This probably in the coming months, maybe next year, I'm assuming around 60 per month. That is one version of the truth, right? The customer's perspective and expectation, because they might not know, depends on your business model. Like how in, for instance, in ad tech, how much trainings are you going to watch? Yeah. I mean, average number of employees I have divided by the number of free time I'm allowing to give them to spend on this is you do some math, right? How good it is, is the next. The second thing you have is uh, at some point, not on day one, you're going to have uh, history. That's good. We're, we have some history. So we're going to see, okay, typically in January, they had 50. And then in February, they had 60. And in March, they had 70. But in the summer, it was a bit less because, you know, it was hot. People didn't want to go into a hot warehouse and eat bananas. They went out for ice cream. And then when the fall came, uh, winter came, people ate more bananas. So you're going to have some trends throughout seasons, throughout uh, general usage. Your, uh, how is it comparing on your growing customer base? So that's the second one. And then there's the actuals. So you also know the actuals. And when you put those three ultimately together, you know how good the customer's guess is. You know what history will tell you on the trends. And based on that, you can make kind of your own analysis. Okay, I'm going to meet somewhere in the middle of all of this. And that's going to be my forecast of monthly revenue on usage. And that is something I think is really tough for many people to work on. But I think many are working on that now for many CFOs. That's the crucial part. That will give you a super clear Maybe not 100% spot on, neither is subscription business, but definitely get you close to an actual good forecast. Okay. So does that change the way sales now have to operate? Whichever pricing model you have, you're always going to have a lot of sales effort to the original sale, whether that's a yeah. one-off license, whether that's a recurring figure, yeah. or whether that's a variable. And you, you need to get the customer in the first place. If you're in that second model, and it's a recurring revenue, but you're interested in retention. You don't want customers leaving. And that's something we've got in Grow CFO. We want to engage the membership so they're using the service and they don't cancel. Now, if you move to the third one, folk are less likely to cancel because the price is going up and down according to their usage. But suddenly, don't you have a a lot of sales effort needing to go into effectively maximizing customers usage once they've signed up yeah definitely i think you know one of the key words coming up when you're talking the word sales is commission that is always a fun talk and that was the biggest talk i think when everybody went and moved away from traditional license purchase moved to subscription it's also like okay normally it was a percentage of this license and that was a lifetime thing right so i mean the money was it this subscription depends on how long they stay so permission what do we do 
and what many companies did is they just took the average length of a contract from a customer times the revenue that would be the license value and that will be the commission the commission would be based on that and this is again now with usage like okay now we need to do something else again you know it it just keeps on uh, making a fun time and i think what people do or what many people are doing uh, that we speak to at least are delaying the commission so they have a starting commission so the customer signs and there's a certain value to like the floor plan the floor of the subscription there's always something that they pay for from the beginning like the base platform or something whatever you call it and there's a commission based on that but there's also a retroactive commission after a year of past signature so the customer signed the usage has been collected over the year they take an average of that and add that to a commission so sales has commission typically twice on a deal so that's the new business salespeople, right? But then, like you say, there's also the account managers, the customer success managers, the ones that need to make sure that usage is up. And I think what I really like about the transition to subscription initially and now to usage is that customer success is no longer customer support, right? It used to be people that had to answer phone calls of angry customers that were unhappy about something. And everybody's like, yeah, the revenue is in, you can walk away. I don't care about you really. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But now it, it's, it's more important that they stay right. And there's a price tag on a happy customers. And it's especially, Kevin, like you said, on the usage part of things. So the longer we can make them stick and the better we train them in using our software, the better we maximize and, and log how their people are logging in on a daily basis in our product, how they're using it, the better and the more money we spend on having them do that well, and the more money will come back. And that is also a commission on customer success typically where they also retroactively are charged based on active users, named users, logging in daily NPS scores. whole set of new KPIs are coming up and I think it's super great. So the question must arise then, how do you actually set the price? That's a fantastic, a difficult question as well. I think for me personally, a model I really like is the leader filler analysis, a leader filler killer analysis, I think it's called. So you take a look at pretty much like this is the thing I offer to my customers. This is all of it, like a big chunk of features or whatever. And what you do is you plot them in like leaders, uh, fillers, killers, uh, add-ons, and many things like that. If you're interested in listening to this, we can send this analysis or you can add it to your uh, subtext maybe. But you basically say, okay, what are my leader products? So let's look at McDonald's, for example. You probably have McDonald's in UK, I think. At least. I think so. Can't say that I've ever been in one. <laughs> That's a smart move. Though. That's a smart move. <laughs> but I think, you know, people don't tend to go to McDonald's to order some fries. People go to McDonald's to order a burger, whatever that burger may be, a McChicken or a Big Mac or something. You know, they go for that. That's the main attraction. And that is what a leader within your solution that is like for you, maybe, you know, if they sign up for Grow CFO. Do they come for the blogs or do they come for the podcast or do they come for, you know, a general chat with Kevin? So they come for the podcast, maybe I would do because I'm a podcast listener, right? So I come to the pro CFO for the podcast and that is your leader. And then you define a few of those key things your service is doing in that leader analysis. And then you do a few of the fillers, which are like French fries, right? So you go to the, if I'm having a burger, I might as well have some French fries. I might as well have a milkshake. And then you have some add-ons. I might as well take some chicken McNuggets. It's also super popular, right? Not for everyone, but optionally, I would like to order them. And that's how you can plot like many of the features. And then typically what you see is the leader are never really usage-based. But McNuggets, you can pay six, nine, or 12, depending on how hungry you are. That is a way to do that. And typically the things you can quantitize, you can do as usage and that deliver a direct value to your customer. So how tangible is it for the customer I'm speaking with that they can choose between one or 10 pieces or 10,000 or 10 million pieces, doesn't matter. If you can get that, and this is a super nice way to do that, and that usually resonates well, but also the season of things. Like we use the indexation example, right? What thing is relevant all year? And what is maybe not relevant all year? And can we package that differently? I think those are questions you can ask yourself and that analysis really helps with that. That's actually an interesting model, bringing that back to 
predictability of revenue, you've still got a core product in there that has a recurring sale, a single yeah. value. So that is giving you a solid chunk of recurring revenue. And it's the add-ons, the extras that are going up and down. That yes. makes a lot of sense. That's exactly it. But in terms of making this work, what sort of systems do you have to deploy? I think in general, you need to have something where sales can operate in, where they can note down the things they're agreeing with, because it becomes so custom, right? Because maybe a customer you're speaking to has two employees and two people cannot eat more than five bananas every day because they get tired of the flavor and they need something else. They need to go for a Big Mac maybe <laughs> after a while. But also, you know, other customers may need more. So there needs to be something that logs what sales is doing and allow for that customization. You cannot make specific boundaries in usage. You cannot set like, this is what we do. This is the only model we have. This is what you go and sell because usage is not about that. Usage is about that freedom that you're giving your customer. So something that give your sales the flexibility to quote whatever they think is right for the specific customer, because that's also going to make them have a longer stay with you, right? That is one tool you need. Second is a tool to manage that. Yeah, yeah, sorry for pitching union, but something that manages that subscription. So what has been agreed with the customer, which tiers on the bananas, you know, if there's price tiers or how do we get that usage in something that knows that that usage is coming, something that knows those bananas have been eaten and that tells that subscription in order for the additional bananas or the less bananas to be credited or, you know, things like that but also in terms of revenue, because you're now dealing with three completely different revenues, kinds, types, whatever you want to call it. So you have something like a setup fee, typically, which is recognized for many companies as a one-off. I take this full revenue right now and I'm going to spend it all on the Friday night drinks or whatever with the company. And the subscription is where you really feel like, you know, I need to spread this out. So you defer the revenue over monthly over time, typically. Because even though if you get the full invoice annually upfront, it's still nice, but you still have a service to deliver for the other 11 months, right? So you need to get your costs up and running. You need to get the service running. Your staff needs to be there. So you spread that out typically. And then there's the third. We're going to get some fragments of revenue every now and then because of the usage. And that needs to be recognized differently. So that is really a tool, again, like a subscription management tool like Union would be able to lock all those different kinds of revenue on the right times, at the right times. But also, like you said, uh, you touched upon it a bit, like enterprise values, metrics, things like this, they're going to be fluctuating again. So now you finally had that stable revenue versus that high multiplier. Now, how are we going to do that on the usage level as well? So how are we going to make that estimated recurring revenue from usage count in the multiplier as well? And I think when you go for a mortgage in many countries, this is the case. When you go for a mortgage and you're a salesperson, you have a fixed salary and you have a bit of variable salary depending on the commission. And it's a similar model as to recurring revenue and usage billing. And what the bank does when they say how much money you can borrow is they say, we take your base and we believe that's going to come in always. And we're going to take a portion of your forecasted commission. And we're looking at the history of that. So, you know, what has your commission been on the past three years? And we can project that a bit forward. And typically what you see in that commission as well, there's a growing trend because you have been, you know, learning lots of new things in sales. You've been learning some tricks, art of negotiations. Your software has become more expensive. You've moved up in higher markets. So you've got more money. And that's the same in this usage story again. So because of the trends and the things you see, the forecast of monthly recurring revenue coming from usage is actually higher than what your normal recurring fee would have been and because of that projection it takes it back to an average out level same as with the mortgage and that is what they take as the new enterprise value which is typically almost one-on-one -on -one with the subscription model but sometimes even higher because other metrics go up like you said retention customers stick because they don't want to turn because they only pay when they do something why leave <laughs> i pay for what i how active i am so the retention figures goes up the churn goes down the cash is improved all the other things will improve as well, which greatly have an impact on the multiplier, but also the forecasted revenue can be taken in like that. I suppose one very nice thing about this is that in a lot of situations, all those things that you're going to put a variable cost around, a variable price around, probably don't have very much cost behind them. No. 
Exactly. You're certainly in the software world. It's some code that's sitting on a server. Okay, you might use some more CPU, you might use some more bandwidth. But yeah. generally, as the supplier of that particular SaaS product, you're paying for that anyway. And the amount of usage doesn't really vary things. So this is purely a pricing method that is based on maximizing the value you're giving to the customer. Exactly. And the, the main thing, if you look at like, it's the good, better, best principle in pricing and packaging. So you have like, you see that all the time when you go to a SaaS website and you check the pricing page, you see like, we have a starter plan, a professional plan and an enterprise plan, right? You see that everywhere. And the goal of that principle is to get as many people as you can on that medium plan, the mid-sized one. So don't get them signed on that starter plan, get them on the middle one. And usage is a fantastic way to get them there. Like you get a few nice things there that they only pay for as they go. So they immediately hop onto the next one. And the right one is only for those customers that really need something specific. The enterprise one really is for the enterprise deals. It's a super relevant. And I think we've all seen examples of this working in practice so well without us realizing it was a super nice usage based model for me i worked with expense management software where you claim your expenses when you're on the road for traveling for business travel having lunch with customers or things like that and we had that as at our company where i worked at that time which was a, a telco but there were 200 people in that company but there was only 10 salespeople. but sometimes the people in the warehouse also needed to they went out for a team event and they also needed to claim the expenses. If they would have been also been paying a five quid per user per month for those warehouse people, they would be super unhappy because like they do maybe two, three expenses per year. So the alternative is not to roll it out into the full company and only give sales users access, but then you have two ways of handling that process, which is also not attractive. So the usage product process is the proposition there was fantastic where they said, okay, we're giving you the platform for, you know, 100 euros in our case, it was uh, per month, and we're going to charge you five cents for every expense claim you do, no matter who it comes from. And that was perfect because then we also kept it under control. When things went economically not so good, then we stopped traveling. And then also our cost and expense management was low. Yeah, it's just great. And I can say another example of that you... For a lot of systems, you may have a group of power users mm -hmm. who are actually in there doing the stuff inside the system. And because so much is web-based, portal-based these days, and there are dashboards around the place and you'd review reports online rather than on pieces of paper, you may have a whole group of users who are effectively going in just read-only. Definitely, yeah. And you can effectively price those two different groups of users in very different ways. Yeah. You certainly want to pay a fee based on, say, having four or five power users. But if you want 100 readers, well, those 100 readers may be something that level of access is nominal or almost free. Yeah, exactly. And we use that exact same principle as well, based on value-based pricing. So we also have, like, depending on where you are with your company, you pay a certain amount. So I can always explain the price to the position where people is in but you see the user and the role-based pricing is one of the most common use cases because the cfo needs to have access to like a bi tool because she wants to see many many things but another person a business controller is filling it up with data working on a daily basis you know making sure that everything is correct the graphs work and then there's one person just taking every month a few snippets for the powerpoint the, the board presentation if you would pay equal sum it's not a nice thing Exactly. Something can get very expensive very quickly if everybody... Yeah, can... exactly. Yeah. I can see lots and lots of pluses of this type of model going forwards. I suppose one thing that I hadn't properly engaged with with variable pricing is that idea of the three levels that you frequently see on a website, the basic service, the medium one, you say they're trying to direct yeah. everybody through to, and the gold-plated one. I'd always thought of that, well, that's just three levels for this. That's not variable pricing, but that's exactly where variable pricing starts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's and exactly it's not it. uncommon to have little plugins, little extras you can buy around those prices. No, exactly. Because 
in essence, that is also some form of usage, right? I mean, if you don't need the add-on, you don't buy it. It would be unfair to put, uh, like, we, we have, for instance, integrations to HubSpot, Salesforce, and Pipedrive, and, you know, many other CRMs, but customer only needs one, like all of them in one package. <laughs> Customers would be like, yeah, but I don't have HubSpot. Why would I pay for that integration? Yeah. Makes sense if they would ask that. Total sense. Makes total sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Walter, that has been fascinating. Thank you very much for being this week's guest on the Grow CFO Show. Thank you so much for having me, Kevin. I really enjoyed the chat. 